Hello everyone. Um, Felix from Political Arena Victoria, the Politics Society here. Thank you all for coming to this great, 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 great Greens event. Um, so, so um, today, so today we're going to have um, half an hour of question, um, half an hour of speaking from James and Metaria, and then half an hour of questions and answers. I mean, it will be fantastic. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, Kia ora uh, I, on behalf of Queen's I would like to thank Felix, the Politics Society and the Arena Victoria um, for their work of Uh Felix has given me the honour of introducing the co-leaders of my party. Um, in 2009, Materia was elected co-leader of the Green Party and um, in a speech he gave when she became COVID, she committed our party to ending child poverty um, when the Greens get into government and better housing for all. Um, she holds that commitment to this day and we couldn't be prouder to call her COVID. Um, I was 11 years old when we were here, so I found it <laughs> <laughs> James was more recent and I do remember when James was elected COVID and watching his speech two years ago that he gave at our party AGM when he said that capitalism isn't working and the free market is dead. Um, James has a commitment to a fairer, smart green economic system for Aotearoa and um, tackling climate change and making our planet much more sustainable. So without further ado, the co-leaders of the Green Party and ministers in the next government of <laughs> Is it okay if I speak without the mic? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I find it gets in the way. So my name is James Shaw and I am the other co-leader of the Green Party of Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand. On Friday, the global fight against climate change suffered a setback of huge proportions. <laughs> I've got more dad jokes where that came from. <laughs> so I'm going to talk tonight about uh, climate change and the risk and also the opportunity of climate change and what it means for us and what it means for you. Uh, and Materia is going to talk about uh, housing uh, and what that means uh, for you and so on because I know that that's a very immediate uh, concern. And then those are, those are kind of like a couple of things that we know of, like big and important, but also that you've got a lot of different questions and concerns as well. And so when we get to the question and answer bit, please feel free to just go off piste, go wherever you'd like to go, ask us about anything. If it's one of those things where we can't really give you an answer, we'll just say something else. Um, so I know that climate change is one of those things that is kind of gargantuan in scale. Right? Terrifying when you get into the science of it. And it's always something that happens in the future to someone else, somewhere else. Polar bears floating on blocks of ice, drifting towards Hawaii uh, from, uh, from the Arctic. Right? And that can be uh, kind of a very disempowering place for us. Because it's all so big that we can't do anything about it. It's all so out there. Uh, and also there's no urgency to it, because it's something that's going to happen in the future, right? Sea levels are going to rise in the future. But actually, uh, it is a problem for us, here and now. So in 2013, there was a drought uh, here in New Zealand that wiped $1.5 billion off our agricultural exports that year, right? It was longer and deeper than any other drought in the last 60 years. And we've always had droughts, right? But this one was particularly, uh, particularly severe. And Victoria University actually did a peer-reviewed study that said that the length and the severity of that drought was 90% down to climate change, right? 
So it had a significant impact here and now. The same year, literally a couple of months after that drought finished, there was the largest storm since the Wahine disaster, right? Again, about 60 years ago. And in that storm, this city suffered $4 million of direct damage just in terms of things like the island-based seawall getting wiped out uh, and, and kind of various other damage to the, to the city. But around the country, there were $36 million worth of insurance claims related to that storm, right? And we know that there are more frequent and more severe storms happening as a result of climate change. So when the people of Dunedin South were flooded a couple of years ago, Whanganui flooded uh, literally the same month, and then again earlier this year, um, other parts of, uh, of the country are suffering more frequent and more severe flooding than they ever have before. One in 100 year weather events are now happening every year. And our infrastructure is struggling to kind of keep up with that. And so when people say that there is a cost to kind of doing anything about climate change, there is a colossal cost to not doing anything about climate change. And the debate in New Zealand, thankfully, has moved on because, you know, a few years ago we used to argue about whether it was happening or not, right? And if it was happening, did it have anything to do with humans? Was it us? And if it did have anything to do with humans, actually, was it all that bad? And if it was that bad, could you do anything about it? And in New Zealand, at least, and in pretty much everywhere else in the world, except for the United States of America, that is now, yes, climate change is happening. It is us. It is bad. And we can do something about it. And that is where it gets exciting. Because while it might be the greatest challenge, not just of our time, but of all time, it is also a colossal opportunity to create a better world. And that's what gets me excited. And that's why I'm doing uh, what I'm doing. So I, I have this view that, yes, climate change is like tough, right? A big, tough problem to handle. But it is also the greatest economic opportunity in at least a generation. And this is what I think is exciting for you all, because you get to live in the world where we, where we fix all of that. And your jobs and your careers and your families get to inhabit that world where it's all about the solutions rather than about the problem which is where it's been kind of for the last few decades. So if you think about it, in every field, there is a tremendous kind of new industrial revolution going on. If you look at energy, for example, right, you know that Elon Musk is creating gigafactories out in the Arizona desert. He's built one already, and he's got another 99 that he wants to build, and he thinks if he builds 99 gigafactories, that that will be enough to supply all of the battery power to store all of the electricity that the entire world needs based on its current usage. Right? And that includes switching our entire vehicle, planetary vehicle uh, fleet over to electric vehicles. 9,900 gigafactories. And we're already 1% of the way down. In New Zealand, we have the opportunity to put solar panels on kind of every roof where it makes sense to have a battery pack uh, that stores that electricity until you need it in the evening, where you can bring your electric car home and plug it in and recharge it, where you can earn money from selling your excess energy back into the grid rather than have to spend your hard-earned dollars buying more energy from the grid. So it changes household economics as well. Now, you know, we will probably be a technology taker when it comes to things like solar panels or electric cars or battery technology. But we have an opportunity in this country to be the very first place that knits all of those things together, packages it up, and then sells that system back to the rest of the world. Why? Because we are small. 
So people often say that New Zealand's kind of lack of size is a real economic disadvantage. Actually, with some of the stuff, it becomes a, a, a huge advantage. I don't know, accidentally do that a lot. Just let me know when it gets boring. So, you know, we can, we can move very quickly, right? With a low population base and OECD country, you know, we have the opportunity to install this kind of stuff, to experiment with it, to move faster and install it across our entire country into every community, into every household, into all parts of the economy faster than just about any other country in the world, if we choose to do so. In transport, you know, I was talking about electric vehicles, but, you know, we also have this in incredible opportunity here because much of, <coughs> accidentally, much of New Zealand's transport infrastructure has kind of fallen to bits over the last few decades, except for the motorways, uh, which are doing pretty well. But we're getting to that point now where we're having, we were realising that the ways that we did things from the 1950s through to now, which is just build more motorways when, motorways when we ran out of space for cars, that actually we're coming up, the, up against the limits of that. And actually, the most efficient and effective way to move people and freight around is on things like rail or mass rapid transit, bicycle lanes, and, and so on. And so one, we're, at, we're actually at this point now where because we have only built motorways for about the last 30 or 40 years, and because we've got, like, our rail networks completely fall into bits and, you know, and we don't yet have a cycle in there, we know that because we underinvested in all of those things, that we have to now do that. And now that we've actually got the technology and the insight about how all of those things fit together, we can actually build all of that in a way that really works, where it's one system, not just disparate bits of, bits of a system. And again, we can show the rest of the world how that's done. At the moment, the rest of the world, or bits of the rest of the world, are showing us how it's done. But we've got an opportunity now, at this particular point in history, to kind of leapfrog uh, and to do it better. And I know, uh, just a quick question, how many of you come from farming families? Okay, a few. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about agriculture, uh, which you don't often hear uh, Greens talking about uh, in the kindest terms, because we know that the impact of our largest industry is having on climate change, but also on our riverways and on our soils uh, and so on. And that is simply a result of doing kind of too much of one, of one thing, which happens in every country with every industry where you basically overplay your hand is, is you get the kinds of effects that we're seeing as a result of that. But there is a tremendous opportunity if we just flip the, flip the problem on its head. So uh, the, the reason I'm talking to a bunch of people who aren't in the, in the farming community is because, you know, this is our number one industry, right? All of us, to some extent, are actually dependent on it because the revenue that it earns overseas brings in enough to keep the rest of us going, you know, to maintain other industries uh, and so on. And there's an incredible opportunity for all of us, I think, if we were to work together about how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be in the future. So I'll give you an example. Uh, a tonne of organic dairy, of organic milk powder sells for about $14,000 on, on the overseas market. Right? Um, and a tonne of kind of commodity powder that's produced from an intensive dairy farm sells for about $3,100 uh, on the overseas market. Bounces around a little, but that's roughly its level at the moment. Now, on an organic farm, you're only running half as many cows, so you only get half as much milk. So you've got to take that fourteen thousand dollars and you halve it, and you get seven. That's still more than twice as much value for a ton of organic as a ton of commodity. But here's the upside: if you're running an organic dairy farm and you're running half as many cows. You're not putting nitrogen fertilizers into the soils which leach into the waterways. You're putting half as many um, emissions into the atmosphere. In other words, your impact on the environment is a fraction of what it is if you're running a commodity, uh, a commodity dairy farm. But you're getting more than twice as much value out of what you're doing. So when we start to think about what we think of as a problem, you know, there's too many cows, there's too much pollution, stuff like that, and you flip it on its head and you say, well, where's the opportunity here? Internationally, 
the world is crying out for really high value, top brand, good quality product, whether it's you know, agricultural product or you know, whether it's from wine or actually tourism or a whole bunch of other industries as well. And, and New Zealand has the opportunity, and in fact in many ways already is, the premium, the premium brand there, right? And if we protect that, and if we enhance that, then that's how we get to make our way in the world. So to me, I see that as, again, tremendously op- uh, exciting because we have the opportunity to be the world's first fully sustainable economy anywhere in the world and to show the rest of the world how it's done. And if we can do that, if we can have clean energy uh, and or renewable en- clean renewable energy uh, and, and um, environmentally friendly agriculture and clean transport, turns out the rest of the world is looking for those things too. If we can work out how to make how, you know, how our farmers can make more money out of farming in a way that has zero impact on the environment, but they make more money out of it. Well, guess what? There are a lot of other countries in the world that have got cows too, and they're interested in that. Because we're all in the, this is the thing about climate change. We're all in the same boat here, regardless of what Trump thinks. So, um, so to me, that's, kind of, that's, the, that's the opportunity right? that's, face, that's facing us. And a lot of people say, yeah, but, you know, kind of why or, you know, is this real or is it even possible? Does it it sound like science fiction? Well, we've made a commitment in the Green Party that New Zealand will be a net zero emission economy by the year 2050, right? We know that that is technically possible, although it is eye-wateringly ambitious. And you sort of think, well, why would you want that? But I just want you to think about what your lives are going to be like in the year 2050. Right? You'll be in your early 50s, I'm guessing, for most of you. Some of us, not. (coughs) Some of us, some of us. Just a self-referential kind of thing. So, so, So you'll be in your early 50s. For the sake of argument, let's say that you've got kids. I know not everybody's going to have them. But let's, let's just, for the sake of argument, say you've got kids. You'll be living in a world where you can go to sleep at night knowing that the beach that you've been on that day will still be there for your kids and their kids to enjoy, unthreatened by rising seas. And in the morning, you'll be woken up by a dawn chorus of birds that once bordered on extinction, but no longer. And after lunch, you'll pack your car, you'll pack your kids into an electric car, and you'll drive home on congestion-free roads while your kids are counting the carriages on the freight train that's running on the tracks alongside, alongside you. And maybe if you have time, when you get nearly home, on the way home, you'll stop by a river, and you'll swim in it, because you can. And then you'll go home to your warm, dry house, which is generating electricity and recharging your car. And on Monday morning, in that New Zealand, you'll get up and you'll catch the tram into town and you'll go to work and you'll do a meaningful day's work at some kind of social enterprise or a clean tech startup. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll do a day of good work for real wages and then you will come home at night knowing that you'll be able to afford not just to put food on the table, but also to make the rent or the mortgage at the end of the month. And the community that you will be living in will be rich and diverse. There'll be the kids of Syrian refugees who are playing alongside, you know, first-generation Chinese immigrants, Tangata Whenua, Pacifica. 
or if you're like me, fifth or sixth generation Pākehā. And, you know, people's circumstances will always be different. But if someone runs into trouble, then you pitch in to help out because our communities will be rich and connected. And that, that's the country I want to live in. That's the future I'm committed to. It's not science fiction. It's not, it's not particularly grandiose. But it is 100% possible if we change the government, in my humble opinion. <laughs> not so humble. So you can see there that we have choices about where we choose to invest, how we choose to live, the rules that we use to decide what kinds of houses we want to live or that govern how we, how we plan our towns and our cities. And that, when, you know, when I get up and I talk about the green economy and people go, well, what are you talking about? That's what I'm talking about, right? It's actually, it's that tangible. It's also that close. Uh, and to me, that is tremendously exciting. And that's the journey that I'd like to invite all of you along on tonight. I'd like to introduce you to the other, other co-leader of the Green Party, Natulia <laughs> Tudor. And my job was to, volunteer job, was to work with 
people who had become unemployed or who had been for a long time, to take them down to what was then DSW, now Twins, the DSW office, and make sure they were getting their entitlements, make sure they were getting housing support, the basic stuff, the stuff we're still doing today with women's clients, because the system hasn't changed enough. And in the 80s then, we were, there were mass marches, um, some of you will remember, mass marches all around the country. And that was where I kind of got to understand the politics of what had happened to my family and the people that I loved. Because it had just happened to us, right? You just suddenly don't have any work anymore and you can't get any. And so you, and suddenly you can't afford the rent, so you're continually moving from place to place. Because, and you don't really think about it when it's happening to you. I certainly wasn't at 14. Wasn't thinking about it in terms of there is this great place in Parliament and they make all these decisions and there is treasury with their reports and ideas about how this economic experiment might work and like, like you don't think about that, you just suffer it. But getting involved with the Unemployed Rights Movement was the way I was able to understand what was happening to us. And what was happening is that our family, our people, were being subject to an experiment, a political experiment, by people who had absolutely no idea we existed. We just did not exist for those people. They couldn't see us, they couldn't hear us, they never met us. Our families meant nothing to them. We were numbers in a treasury projection. We were the few thousand that might lose their job, but that's okay because over here we're going to grow the economy and a few thousand others might get more work. It reminded me then just how important it is to not have other people make decisions for you because <laughs> they can't be trusted. In my humble opinion. It reminded me just how important it is to actually have a voice for those who are making decisions about us. And those with the MPs who are in Parliament, when we are making decisions every day that affect families. I'll tell you about some of them soon that are happening now. And we need to make sure that the people who are the most affected by those decisions are there at the table, that they have a voice and they're being heard and they're making the decisions. Because if they're not, then the decisions, they'll, they'll be the clear and damage. They'll be the ones that get harmed and get ignored. And I don't think that's at, at all acceptable in a 21st century Western democracy like ours. We can do much, much better than that, and we should, and we will. That's why we use MEP. That's why we, in the Greens at least, very conscious about diversity in our list that we're presenting to you at this election of the people you get to choose who will represent you. And that's why we continue to stand up and do what's right even when it's not easy. Because the people who need us to speak for them, the environment that needs us to speak for it, need to know, have confidence, that somebody has got their back. That's why I'm still in this job. 15 years after getting elected um, into, into Parliament. The two issues that have really driven me during this period of 15 years has been inequality and child poverty. Inequality because I've lived it, I've seen it, I know exactly how it presents in the real world and how it is ignored or manipulated in the political world. And child poverty too, for the same reason. That these are lived experiences, and we need to have people in Parliament who remember what that was like, and will stand up for those people who aren't there to speak for themselves. At the moment, you know uh, that we have this housing crisis in this country, and it's becoming a bit of a mantra to say housing crisis, right? And it's a bit of a concern that it's kind of just starting to be repeated as a thing that you say. But it is a absolutely fundamental to a functioning society that its people are properly housed. When you go back, you look anywhere through history in any community and society, you simply cannot have a well-functioning, healthy community if you don't have people being housed properly in whatever way they choose. Housing has become the core means by which we can identify the effects of inequality the growing gap between rich and poor. And it is also becoming the acute 
Um, well, not really cute. The, kind of the pointy end, it's like more human language, the pointy end of child poverty. Because when the housing is inadequate, when it's cold and damp, when it's too expensive, it's kids who will suffer the most. Children's Commissioner has said that up to 15 children a year die from illness that is caused by cold and damp housing in this country. This winter, up to 15 babies will die. And what should happen? That should just cut the home insulation fund, so there now is no longer any subsidy for insulating uh, rental homes. Uh, we know that there's a housing crisis all over the country and there needs to be this significant investment in community organisations and every organisations, local councils and with the private sector to build more decent homes for families to live in. We know we need to stop the sell-off of state houses immediately, repair them where it's possible and move the families who are living in their cars now into those homes so their kids have got a decent place to grow up and live. Because if we don't do those things, up to 15 babies will die this winter. Along with another 1,600 New Zealanders, mostly old people actually, who will die this winter. We have additional winter deaths in this country because our housing is so miserable and because electricity is so expensive. So these are, so you know, you, you get your budget documents and your treasury documents, you have MSD writing reports about ways that they can help and you know you hear all the political ramblings about um, smoke alarms and a bit more insulation here and a bit of this and a bit of that. But what you don't hear them talk about enough is that there are families, individual people who will suffer the direct consequence of doing something or doing nothing. So that's what gets me up in the morning to go and do this work. It is actually more cheaper than that. But because <laughs> actually there's some amazing things that do happen. But if we don't carry the seriousness of the political decisions that are being made with us, then it's too easy to think that it's really not our problem, that it's somebody else's business, that it doesn't really matter, uh, that somebody else will take care of it. But nobody else is going to take care of it if we don't take care of it ourselves. We don't want other people making these decisions for us. If you want the kind of country that James was describing, which was a beautiful, amazing place to live, that is just around the corner, then we have to choose that and act on it. So I'm encouraging you to vote, definitely encouraging you to vote. I'd really love it if you voted for us, of course. Bone Greens is great. But if you choose not to, and you do have free will, and <laughs> the right not to, at least do it. And get other people to do it. At least take control of the kind of country that is being shaped for you and for your kids and for your future. For me and my daughter and her kids and their future. Because we don't take control, we leave it in the hands of people who don't see us, who don't know us, who don't make decisions about us. We leave it in the hands of people who think 15 children this year is just collateral damage. Kia ora
uh, the generation process, for example, um, coming through in plenty of processes. But it's so isolated from anywhere else in the world, there's no danger of uh, infestation from any other country. And um, the value of the products. So, does the Green Pipe have a, a policy to uh, become entirely organic in the whole country? Um, <clears throat> well, it would, no, uh, not necessarily, uh, as a stated, um, not as a stated goal. Uh, but I think when you say, well, what, what, <clears throat> what are the incentives for uh, people to switch? That's clearly where you know the kind of middle to upper income earners in other countries. That's the kind of thing that they uh, that they want. And so it's about saying, well, what, what do we need to do to kind of organise ourselves around uh, you know a, around that sort of principle? And there are some uh, there are some kind of hopeful signs here. I mean, you look at Hawke's Bay, uh, who are looking at being at, you know an entirely organic. Uh, region, um, you know, that's a choice that, that they're sort of trying to make for themselves. Because if they do, then like organic Hawke's Bay will attract a, a premium uh, overseas. But at the moment, there are things that get in the way. So there's a um, there's an organic tea brand here uh, in, in the wine country called Zilong Tea. Uh, and Zilong um, sell uh, tea to China for um, three... Hundred and sixteen New Zealand dollars for a one hundred and thirty gram tin, right? It's really good tea. <laughs> it's not that good, and and the brand is all to do with the soil and the air and the water of New Zealand where it's where it's created. But in New Zealand, you don't have to certify that your product is organic to put the phrase organic on it, right? Uh, and when the woman who runs it, who's this classic hard case Singaporean lady, rang up the agency to say, uh, what do I need to do to put Made in New Zealand labels on our tins? They said, well, tell us how many labels you need. <laughs> and she told me then a story about another food producer that's bringing product in from overseas, packaging it here, slapping a Made in New Zealand label on it, and then sending it back to where it came from. So we're not, we're not even doing the minimum to protect... That you know that that kind of brand. So if we're going to do anything like that, we've actually got to put some backbone into it. Anyone else? <laughs> Can um, since the emissions training scheme was introduced, it's cost New Zealand approximately $2.3 billion, with little to negligible kind of impact. So how would the Green Party propose changing or replacing the emissions training scheme? Well, the, so it's not only has it had little impact, actually our emissions are 19% higher now than when the emissions trading scheme came into place. So you have to say that as a piece of public policy, it is a gargantuan disaster. Because the whole point of an emissions trading scheme is to reduce emissions, and the precise opposite has happened. Uh, and that is because the government came in in 2008 and... and and changed the settings, basically gutted the scheme, so that it's so it's trading units, but having no having no impact. So you've got to have you've got to have a real price that actually makes a um, actually changes behaviour. Um, and people will say, well, won't won't companies simply pass that cost on to their customers? And the answer is yes. That's the point. You actually want to price in pollution, right? Which at the moment is not priced into the product, and then. What happens is consumers start to go, oh, this thing over here is really expensive because it's got, you know, this, it's high carbon. But this product over here is low carbon and therefore cheaper, right? So you start, that sort of things start to flow towards the low carbon, cheaper things, and companies are incentivized to start switching over from where they are now to where we want them to be in the future. So our, our proposal is basically you put a proper price on the pollution that causes climate change, 
and then you return that money to people directly in the form of uh, income tax cuts so that they've got an extra dollar in their pocket and they can make that choice about whether to spend their money on petrol uh, when it comes to filling up a petrol car or on electricity uh, at home. And um, you'll see a switch in the economy pretty quickly once you've got that in place. So that would be working with a market-based system? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a pricing mechanism, right? That's all it is. Hello. Um, got a question for the back of the end. What are your thoughts on Gary Morgan? <laughs> <laughs> and what do you work for them? <laughs> oh, Alright. I quite like Gareth. So, um, I actually have worked with him. Before I got into Parliament, I was working at a social enterprise startup agency uh, called the Arkina Foundation. We shared offices with the Morgan Foundation. Uh, and I find, uh, you know, a lot of the kind of research and stuff that that foundation did, uh, you know, really good. Um, I think that. So he's got a couple of challenges, right? The, f the five percent threshold for getting into Parliament is a colossal barrier, right? It is, you know, and lots of rich white guys have founded political parties uh, to, and tried to get through that and, and haven't, right? Um, and and so, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I rate him more than kind of. Paul oh, Craig. Paul well, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Kim.com, uh, um, but I, it, it, is, it is colossal. And essentially, what Gareth is looking for is a Green Party that will work with the National Party. Right? That's essentially why he is why he's doing what he's doing. And so then the question is, if you're already voting for National, what's your incentive to switch to a political party with such a low chance of getting in Parliament? And if you're a Green Party voter, what's your incentive to switch if you know, uh, uh, get given that. And I, I just think it's, you know, I've got a lot of time for the guy, but I just, I, I think it's a bit of a, um, you know, it's a bit of a mesh. My, yeah, I think that's true. Um, my view is, yes, there was a good work that came out of the Morgan Foundation, and it would have been better, I think, he would have had a better chance of getting his stuff into the political realm if he stayed in that one. Um, I am frustrated that he doesn't take the job seriously. Uh, again, it's like, it's part of the, the rich white man disease that they kind of think that because they're good at making money, they've got to give everything. And, <laughs> to, and they're not. It's just to make that clear. Um, and two, this is, this is a job where you do, like, I mean, I've been talking about this, it's a job where you actually make decisions about people's real lives. It's not an academic exercise. It's not about having um, a kind of intellectual engagement in some grandiose ideas. People are affected by the decisions that we make every day. And unless you take the job, I find it impossible to take him seriously if he doesn't take the job seriously. And he doesn't. He said so pretty clearly. I'd also say um, we have a much better cannabis policy than Top Gun. <laughs> 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 The question is, what about the harmful effects of batteries, right? So, particularly disposal, um, where, where that, that is really problematic. 
Um, so the thing is, uh, it's less harmful than burning dinosaurs and putting them into the atmosphere. Uh, and there is new battery technology that is cleaner, uh, that's emerging all the time. So there's a, um, you, you know about Moore's Law, you know, in relation to uh, how the, the output um, is kind of doubling every six months. So they're becoming way more efficient, but also there's kind of, there's almost like an environmental Moore's Law that goes alongside that, which is that as the technology improves so rapidly, the, um, the, the new technology, which is less harmful, is also um, becoming kind of rapidly more, uh, rapidly more available. So that's it's something, I mean, there are, you know, there are consequences to it, right? Um, and as with, I mean, batteries also depend on, um, you know, lithium at the moment, which is a finite resource. So you can see a world where you run out of lithium, you know, so that, that's all, you know, that's all stuff that needs to be factored in. But I think that it, as it certainly, at least as a bridging technology, uh, then it's a whole lot better than combustion engines and fossil fuel power plants. Just, to, just enough time for one more question. This one. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions. I can just talk. It's fine. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I've got two questions. If that's all right. First of all, I just have to comment on <laughs> on, on Bell English's um, statement today about Rex Tillerson. Um, just discussing the fact that we have um, shared norms and values still, which I find quite difficult to accept. Um, also, just do you have any um, ideas about maybe making it easier for first time car buyers to buy electric cars, that sort of thing? Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement on that front at the moment. Yeah. Oh, do you need your car to develop? Okay. So, Rex T. Um, the dinosaur. Uh, I think so. I, I, you know, I can see where uh, Billing was trying to go there. You know, and and he's talking about the United States in general rather than about the, the Trump administration. But I have been um, frankly appalled at the uh, lack of spine uh, that I think that this government has shown in relation to the Trump administration. Not just in relation to pulling. <laughs> not just in relation to pulling out of the Paris Agreement, but on other things as well, like human rights and, and some of the other, like frankly appalling uh, things that um, now President Trump has has engaged in. Uh, and I think that if you look at the history of this country, you know we were champions of the nuclear free movement worldwide. Uh, and we got punished for that by the United Kingdom, by France, by the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, but we were proud to take a leadership stand and to say, you know, we're better than this. We can be better than this. And we choose to lead, not to follow. And we choose to stand up for what's right rather than just what the best trade deal that we can get might be. And I think we had an opportunity today, uh, which we missed, uh, because um, basically the Prime Minister softballed it when he had an opportunity to stand up. Linked to cars, um, the best thing we could do is have a government procurement policy that we supported. I mean, there'll be others, you might have other ideas of what they are. A government procurement uh, policy that also supported business to be able to transition their fleet from. Um, uh, to electric cars because that helps to build the second hand market in electric cars. There's amazing people doing incredible things. Um, there's a guy who's on the roof of me who just builds his own. And <laughs> like, it's really cool. He's this crazy German guy. He's squeezed all the time and he's really awesome. Yeah, I just out there. But, but so he's, you know, he's just building them and, um, and people, lots and lots of people are doing their best to make that transition where they can. But um, there are also just thousands of families that can't afford to make make the shift. So we need to do it partly um, through a government procurement program that also branches out and provides incentives to business to do the same. And that way we build a second hand market and we can yeah. And we could do it, we could do it in this country easily enough. Anything you want to add? Yeah, look, so um, when Matt talks about incentives, there's a thing called fringe benefit tax, uh, which applies to basically company vehicles. And 
90% of all new cars sold in this country are company fleet vehicles, right? bought, bought by company fleets. But they only last three to five years in that company and then they go into the second hand market. If we removed the fringe benefit tax from electric vehicles, as Norway did, we would get a similar result to what you get in Norway, which is that one in five new cars sold in Norway is an electric car now. And by 2025, you won't even be allowed to buy a combustion engine car in Norway. Let's beat Norway. Let's beat Norway. We can beat Sweden when it comes to like energy, renewable energy. We can yeah. beat Norway when it comes to cars. Okay, cool. <laughs> so somebody said that, that was the last question, but we, look, we yeah. can go online. So. <laughs> if you want to go ahead, go ahead. Yo. Um, in terms of the, uh, the health standards and health regulations of, of housing, yeah. historically speaking, like it's pretty good now. I'm sure there are less kids dying of these illnesses than it used to be, I think like 50 years ago. Um, the issue that we're facing urgently now is that they're just completely unaffordable and poor families can't afford to have like, you know, big houses. So how are you going to increase the supply of houses enough for it to be affordable while increasing these regulations? Yeah, absolutely. So part of, part of the problem is our housing stock is very old. Right? So yes, they, they, were better, they weren't particularly well insulated, but they were better quality in those early years. Um, and so there was less harm. But um, over time, the quality has dropped um, of the houses, especially that were built during the 80s. It was a bad time, the 80s. Um, <laughs> we'll just put the fashion and the politics yeah, yeah. out of our minds. Bad, <laughs> yeah. Get bad. Um, but, um, and uh, so we're kind of living with this legacy of poor regulation in the housing, in the housing over a long period of time. Post that first wave of state house building, that was really good quality in the main. Um, so one of the things that we've proposed is you need to have ways to move people out of renting into their own home. Um, because part of it is um, there's a kind of there's a blockage. People who are just on the cusp of being able to afford a mortgage or something like it can't save the deposit and pay rent because rents are too expensive. Um, uh, don't qualify for a commercial mortgage for because of past um, uh, past debt history often if they're low income families. So there's lots of barriers to people making that next step. So we've, we've proposed, proposed uh, progressive ownership, which is a form of rent to buy, which means that um, which is built so that you don't have to have a deposit and you don't have to get a mortgage. Um, you basically, government is building houses through supporting community organisations and social enterprises and iwi organisations and local councils who are all very good at building homes, actually. They're the experts. They, government supports them to be able to build homes through government supported programmes. And then people who are living in those homes have lots of different pathways to move from renting that house to buying that house, or from renting um, that house to be able to save for a deposit because there's other supports around them that make it possible. So the, the problem is we have, we used to have, say, say the advanced loans, Maori Affairs loans, you could capitalise the family benefit. I mean, we had, used to have all of these government supported financial programmes that enable families be able to get the money together to buy their own house. Um, and that just that we just don't have those anymore that support that working working in um, middle income families. On top of that, we have to massively improve the regulation around the quality of homes. At the moment homes only have to be insulated to the standard that was set in 1978. Um, that was national's great change to the law when it came to housing. Um, Last year. Last year, yeah. Last year, they set the standard of 1978, and we got to the 80s. Um, so we need to, so, um, which is, which is a, actually an appalling thing to be doing. So we need to be setting the standards of home insulation, and then providing landlords with both carrots and sticks to be able to um, fix up their home. That's why we're such strong advocates of the home insulation program. The Greens built. Um, Labour agreed to it, National agreed to it, but they cut it back, but that needs to come back into force so that we can, there's still another 700,000 New Zealand homes that are insulated, um, which is a huge number of homes, just for that alone. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Uh. Um, can you 
So, this is a fraught issue, uh, and it's fraught for a whole series of reasons, but one of which is that the, the kind of narrative around immigration has been captured by the anti-immigration lobby and by one political party in particular for about three decades. Uh, and it makes it virtually impossible to get into that conversation without it becoming like a conversation about race uh, and so on. And so we um, absolutely are against uh, xenophobia um, and against racism uh, and uh, it really concerns us that that is where the conversation has really uh, ended up in this country. And so um, I, I guess the, the main principle behind our stand on immigration is that you start with a humanitarian principle rather than with an economic principle. And it really pisses me off that we treat uh, voluntary migrants, people coming to this country, as economic units, right? Whose job it is to add to our gross domestic product uh, and to work for below minimum wage uh, in uh, exploitative industries. Or uh, as if they're students coming in um, because we're not prepared to uh, pay for our own, uh, you know, uh, students, right, to sort of subsidise our own, uh, our own edu education. And in particular, you know, when you look at the plight of those Indian students uh, kind of last year, these are people, you know, many of whom are not coming to the universities, you know, they're getting the brand that they're being sold back home in India, primarily, but also, also China and other countries, but primarily India. The brand that they're being sold is, come to New Zealand, get a fantastic A-grade, world-class education, uh, and then there's sort of like a pathway to, to New Zealand citizenship in this, you know, fantastic, glorious green country where nobody lives. And so that's a pretty attractive proposition, but then what a lot of them find when they get here is that they're, they're, this so-called world-class education is like two hours on a Saturday in a substandard private training establishment, and the rest of the time they work in a kitchen for below minimum wage and paying colossal rents because we have lost the knack of building houses in this country. And to me that is absolutely uh, unacceptable. But it's, it is incredibly difficult because when you get into like how do we, how do we manage that, kind of all hell breaks loose. Um, you could do medicinal first, 
But it makes no sense if you don't enable people to be able to grow their own or share it with their friends, um, because people can't afford the medicine. So, so I think Peter Dunn did a great thing. Like, I know that people are really down on him about it, and it's taken him 200 years to get here. <laughs> So I looked at Colorado who made $25 million in tax revenue in the first three months after they legalized it. So, and I'm thinking, <laughs> give me a pinch of that action. <laughs> It's a carbon sink, right? It just pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere <laughs> until you smoke it. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 